Okay, we are recording. And it's three o'clock. Yes, all set? Yep. Okay, uh, it is the best of times. It is the worst of times to paraphrase the old line from Tale of Two Cities. And I think everybody knows what I'm talking about in terms of the worst of times. Um, but it's also up to us to try and make the best of times a little bit where we can. And that's hopefully what we're going to do here for the next 90 minutes with this Story Circles session. Uh, there's never been a more important time for the history of science communication than right now, as you know. There's battles going on. In fact, I would argue that last Sunday was perhaps the single most important day in the entire history of the communication of science as Anthony Fauci and his colleagues prevailed over literally the anti-science forces and managed to get the restrictions pushed push back to the end of April. So it's very important what we're working on here uh, right now, even though we're gonna have plenty of fun. Um, let me begin with the introduction of the five members of our story circle. So I'll call on each one of you and just give us a brief introduction who you are, starting with Michael. Hello, my name is Michael Barthelmus. I'm a report writer and editor with the National Park Service as a partner through Colorado State University. And Allison? I'm Allison Mims. Um, I'm also with the National Park Service at a couple of national parks in Montrose, Colorado. And Elizabeth? Hi, my name is Elizabeth Stahlberg. I'm a science policy manager with the Agronomy, Crop, and Soil Science Societies of America in uh, Washington, D.C. Andrea? Uh, hi, my name's Andrea Taylor. I'm a PhD student who's studying psychology at the University of Waikato in New Zealand. And Miba? Uh, I'm Neva Sensen. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow, uh, also in psychology, also at the University Okay, so you notice we've got five members in this circle, three of whom from the United States and two from New Zealand. I did a visit there last fall and we ran two story circles there at the University of Waikato. Um, so this is going to be a demonstration version of our story circles narrative training program we've been developing for the last five years. The five people in this group have all done the training. They're veterans. Um, we, at this point, we've run about 100 circles. We've got about 500 or so graduates from the program. And it's, the training is run in two parts. There is first um, what we call the demo day, which in the pre-virus day involved um, about 40 people in a single room for about six hours. And what you do in the demo day, it's not really a workshop, it's getting to know what the training will involve if you decide to do the training. And at the end of the demo day, then people sign up and usually we get 15 to 20 or so out of the typical 40 people in demo day. Then the host institution starts to put them together into these circles of five individuals who will then meet ideally once a week for the next 10 weeks for the 10 one hour sessions. And <clears throat> the key thing with story circles is this is not like a university course. Um, university courses are more intellectual, this is more visceral, and this is about building intuition, it's more for the practical real world. There are no lectures, there's no guests, there's no readings, none of that stuff. It's fairly simple, it's mostly built around this single tool, the ABT template and a few other tools that we've developed to go with it. The analogy that we've used from the beginning is that it's like um, physical fitness. Think of the narrative part of your brain as being like a muscle, <clears throat> muscle that needs to be conditioned over time. This is like going to the gym and doing these repetitive workouts week after week after week as you build this intuition and basically building muscle memory, whatever you want to call it. Um, for the session itself, these 10 one-hour sessions, it's a single hour that is regulated or structured with this video, queuing video that you'll be seeing. And the hour is broken into two half hours. So the first half hour is narrative analysis, where the five people are given material that we've selected, um, five samples of text that they'll analyze using the ABT template. The second half hour is narrative development, where one of the five people has a narrative, uh, one to two paragraph statement or a description of a project they're doing. That's their narrative that we will work on, and each of the group members has an assignment with the different tools. And so what it ends up being is, everybody trying to ask these questions and kind of poke and prod the, the narrative to help strengthen it and get the best narrative structure possible. So you'll get to see that in the second half hour. And all of you hopefully got the mass email that went out that has attached to it the PDF. In there is both the four abstracts they'll be working on and then the um, one paragraph description 
of the, it's Meva's um, project that she'll be, it's her narrative that we're working on. So you can open those up or print them out or whatever. And um, you can't, uh, we won't have you be part of the discussion, but you should be doing the same exercise and scoring the abstracts when we get to that part. Um, and then later we'll have Q and A after the hour is over with. In story circles, there are three sacred rules. Uh, first off, you have to have five people to run a session. So if you've got a circle that's going and somebody's out of town, you have to postpone. In the beginning, we thought that could be a major problem, but it really doesn't hurt to postpone. If you did all 10 sessions uh, consecutively, it'd be two and a half months. Most circles take about three to four months to go the distance, but we've had some, many that go six months, some that have gone all the way up to a year. And the interesting thing is once a cir circle launches, everybody in the group seems to be very committed to go the whole distance. Out of 100 circles, we've only had one ever really fold up. All the rest have gone the distance. Uh, second, sacred once you start that queuing video you'll see you can't stop it and story circles is not built around perfection this is a, a deeper point that I'll maybe get into in the Q&A it's about iteration and approximation that's what communication is about it's never about perfection it's about giving multiple shots and as a result um, you just do these things as the hour goes on some of them come out perfect some are a mess and you just keep moving on moving on and that leads to the third sacred rule which is that when this queuing video uh, sounds the alarm for the next section, no matter where whoever is speaking is, they have to stop right there and let go of that thought. So even if they have some brilliant idea they're trying to get off, you just have to let go of it and move on. It's really tough sometimes for scientists who are driven for perfection to just let go, but you got to do that with communication. We can talk about that later as well. The last thing to tell you about here in the setup, um, and of course with real demo, uh, real demo days, six, six hours that you learn all this stuff. So for the people observing, some of the stuff will be a little confusing, but it's, it's mostly simple and it'll make sense. But the last thing to tell you about is this exercise that we do at the beginning here of narrative analysis, and you'll have the four abstracts, the queuing video will, will move you along, and what everybody does is we want you to read the first one, the first two are abstracts from published research papers. There's been an editor involved, obviously, in the publication of them, and we want you to read it and ask yourself, um, how close to the ABT structure is this? If it's really good, give it uh, on a scale one to 10, give it an eight, nine or 10, it's all subjective. And if it's a mess, then give it a very low score, one, two or three. And I'll repeat that a couple times during the time while we're working on these. And write down the score that you felt it was and maybe even a few comments of what you're, you thought the problems were. You'll get two minutes for each of these four things. So at the beginning here, um, usually we do five, but for today's shorter session, we're only gonna do four of the samples. Um, we'll cue you, don't jump ahead, go ahead and spend the first two minutes on number one, we'll cue you to move on to number two, and then we will move into the discussion of them eventually, and I think that's pretty much it. Um, high number 10, if you think it's really good, and you're not looking for these words and but therefore, what you're looking for are the forces of narrative, agreement, contradiction, and consequence. So and just happens to be the most common word of agreement but is the most common word for the contradiction. And that's stating the problem in consequence is then what was done. Um, and I think that's pretty much the basics. I may say a few more words as we go along, but on that note, um, Mike, are you to start the queuing video? And Michael will be the moderator throughout this entire session. That's his assignment for this session. So there's our cue for two minutes. And as I say, we'll all just hear, I'm going to say a couple of things as they're working, but mostly everybody be quiet for eight minutes, then we'll begin the discussion. And on that note, whenever you're ready, Michael. All right. Abstract number one, give it a read and give it a score and make some notes. You've got two minutes. And again, high number eight, nine, or 10 if it's really good ABT structure, low number if it's a narrative mess. And that's the only thing you're analyzing here. You, you don't care about other elements of style, just this structure, narrative.
Move on okay. to abstract number two. Yes, number two. And just to forewarn everybody, the first two are science research paper abstracts. Numbers three and four are synopses of movies. And the purpose there is to show you this ABT structure underpins everything in communication, not just scientific papers and business communication and legal communication, but also movies and entertainment, storytelling, the works. Abstract number And abstract number four.
All right. And, <clears throat> yeah, and since we're only doing four abstracts, Mike is going to reset and not do the fifth one. There we go. So take it away. We'll jump into the narrative analysis. So first I'll just go through everyone and ask you what number of score you gave it. And then I'll ask uh, the person who gave it the highest and the lowest to talk about why they did that. And then we'll discuss for three minutes. Uh, Neva, what did you give abstract number one? I gave it a three. A three. Andrea? Muted. A two. A two. Elizabeth? Uh, four. Four. And Allison? Four. I also gave it a four. So we'll start with the lowest score. Andrea, why did you think this was a two? two? Um, I didn't find any contradiction in this, in this abstract at all. So it just really seemed like it was a lot of end. Um, and there were, I don't think there was any setup. So to some extent, it read like this abstract was the whole kind of therefore without setting up the, the ordinary world and any kind of problem. So that's why I gave it a two. I absolutely agree with you. So I think you're just a harsher grader than I am. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth or Allison, you also gave it fours. What did you think was slightly redeeming? Compared to <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I had several A's to start with. Um, the last sentence I thought at least was a decently strong therefore that that sort of solved the, the first question in the A. But yeah, I didn't see a contradiction. There was no but or however. Um, the, the second, I could maybe say it was a therefore, not positive. Um, so I found a lot of A's, a lot of ands, oh, some therefore, but no contradiction. So maybe it's just being nice, giving it a four. <laughs> I, I think I was also being nice. I think you could read this as just a whole bunch of ands. Um, I think I was a bit generous and said that the but was that Einstein's brain did not differ significantly from the others, but then there was no therefore. You know, we did all this, this work to see if his brain was different, but guess what? It's really not. <laughs> it's really I, not. I made that comment as well, but I don't think that was the point of what their, their purpose was. So they had an accidental element of narrative there, but I don't think that it furthered their, their goal. <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, it should have been a lower score. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can, that last sentence, you can kind of infer from the conclusion that they end up coming to watch the problem that they were trying to solve was, and therefore what the but maybe should have been but you know it's very much something you have to infer rather than something that is actually there that's right yeah all definitely. right we're going to move on to abstract number two now uh Miva, what did you give that one what score i gave it a seven a seven andrea so a seven. sorry also a seven seven elizabeth uh three three all right allison Eight. Eight. And I also gave it a seven. So we're seeing some, some similarity and some um, disparity here. Elizabeth, what was so wrong with this one that it got a three? I had a really, really hard time. I, 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 I saw some ABTs, but then some A's and A's and B's and B's. Um, and I, I have to admit, I didn't get even make it to the end in the two minutes. I didn't read the whole thing. So uh, I'm open to learning more about um, amoeboid migration, um, if anyone else wants to chime in. But I found that I, I, didn't, I didn't really see it very clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Allison, you gave it an eight. <laughs> I think I'm being nice again. Um, <laughs> I'm looking for the game. I found a couple of ABTs in there. So. Um, at the beginning, I found a couple A's, a B, then, then to be honest, a little A slash B, and then a therefore um, in the middle, kind of starting with that sentence to this end. I thought that could have been a, a therefore to the setup there. Um, then starting another A section with using a previously developed, and then I found a B, and importantly, that sentence starts there. And then the last sentence, our results being a therefore. So I. I felt like there was, um, you know, sort of two ABTs in there, a little bit of trouble sorting it out early to the middle section, but um, I felt decent that I found two of them in there. 
That's why I gave it an eight. Absolutely. I also thought that to this end was a therefore statement. Um, Eva, Andrew, and I all gave it sevens. Would either of you like to um, elaborate on why, why you thought it was a seven? Um, well, oh, go ahead, Andrea. Um, I was just going to say, I identified the same elements as um, Alison, but the reason I didn't give it a higher mark is that I thought that it could have been, I mean, when you're talking about tumors, cells there's inherent importance there but it could have been made a bit more explicit like what this what the exact real life problem is that this could have solved the study um and i thought that could have been made kind of punchy in the introduction or the lead up to the but. so why is it important essentially yeah exactly yeah did anyone in some ways um, i think oh the, the, oh, sorry, that's the end of uh, abstract number two. We're going to move on to number three. This one was getting good. Miva, what did you? Uh, what score did you give number three? I gave it a two. Two. Andrea. Four. A one. Elizabeth. Uh, five. Five. And Allison. Five. Five. I gave it a four. Uh, Andrea, you gave it a one. You thought this was. Totally lacking. Here to no, elaborate I, on that. I gave it a four. I gave it a, a four. four. Oh, okay. So then, uh, <laughs> Neva, you gave it a two, which is the lowest score. Yeah, I thought it was just all agreement. Um, there's this thing about this person and this and this and this and this and this, and I really couldn't find any kind of um, contradiction, and so there was to me, then no consequence that could come out of the lack of contradiction. Yeah, I, I ag agree with that. Um, Allison or Elizabeth, the, the fives, pretty low scores, but still the highest. Uh, why do you think this was somewhat compelling? Um, well, I could, I could say that it seems to me like one of the ands that's in the text could be a but really easily. Uh, Kayla hosts a YouTube series and she picks these, these topics but she stumbles her way through, therefore the show isn't popular. That's like, therefore the Kayla's Corner hasn't exactly taken off. So I felt like that was a pretty solid ABT right there. Um, and actually now that I'm looking at it, I, I, I thought at first that the, the next two sentences were just kind of really tacked on ands, but you could, you could make an ABT out of that too. Um, she airbrushes out her acne, swoops on heavy eyeliner, but this is a young girl trying to understand what she's going through. You know, therefore, she does so by positioning herself as an expert and a helper to others. So I feel like, I don't know, it wasn't great, but maybe it wasn't even as bad as a five. Yeah. I, like I, Elizabeth, I, I had trouble with the end, placing the end. If I thought maybe it was an and and a therefore not quite attached, but I like how you just frame that. I thought that that's a better way to look at it and it's maybe a little stronger argument. Um, for the whole piece. So yeah, I, I like how you frame that. That being said, the butt isn't in there. Like I had to put it in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to and make I, that happen. I, I feel like you could put kind of in between every sentence, you could put a therefore or a but and it would work. And you like interchangeably anywhere, which to me speaks to there not being a whole lot of structure without us right. having to do the work to kind of see the structure in it. Lean it doesn't always that. work though. It doesn't, you can, you can put it, it doesn't always mm. work. I'm going to move on to abstract, sorry everyone, but that's the way it goes. Um, <laughs> Miva, what score did you give number four? Uh, I gave it a three. A three, Andrea? Five. Five, Elizabeth? Seven. Seven, Allison? Five. Five, and I gave it a six. Uh, Miva, three is the lowest score. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this I couldn't I couldn't figure out what to do with it really, um, because it seemed like maybe the consequence came at the start, and then there was a whole lot of things that were almost contradictions but not quite, and then you arrive at the end it's like it's about a movie, and so you don't want to give away what actually happens, but then it felt like the consequence didn't actually come at the end. I would agree with that. Elizabeth, the seven was the highest score. Yes. Um, okay, so you have these four friends. They visit Transylvania University, and they decide to steal these books. 
but then they question whether their attempts to inject incitement, uh, I'm sorry, excitement are misguided, um, and then there's no therefore. But that is kind of how all of the movie trailers are. Exactly. You know, there's always therefore see the movie. Um, exactly. So, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, when it comes to the movie trailers, I just I I don't like take off too many points for not having a therefore because I feel like the therefore is therefore the movie unfolds like hijinks ensue mm -hmm. or whatever <laughs> um, is kind of a given. So I, I felt like the A B was there. <laughs> I, I agree with that 100% and that, that does come up in the movies. I think, you know, when we think of like scientific writing, I mean, if you're explaining your research, you want to include the therefore, but if you're asking for grant money or trying to convince the public to wash their hands or something like that, the therefore can be sort of that three-dimensional, but therefore you take this action. Right. Unspoken mm -hmm. or implied. Mm -hmm. But that first sentence um, really it threw me for a loop a bit because um, it, it, who, who was it who said it kind of summed up everything that therefore was kind of in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like there could be two buts to this. It could be four male friends live in Kentucky, but that's really boring. Therefore they go to Transylvania or mm -hmm. uh, four male friends live in Kentucky and they go to Transylvania. But once they decide to steal this art, they question whether they're in attempts um, to inject excitement, American dream, et cetera, et cetera. Still no therefore, but it could be sort of two different narrative threads with the but. Yeah, I think with that first line, that really trying to set us up. All right, we've we've <laughs> run out of time on the first half of the uh, the story circle, so that was our abstract discussion. We'll now move on to the narrative development. And Miva, you brought your uh, brief narrative story here. Would you care to read that for the group? Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. Um, so we can be mentally whisked away from the present, back to relive our past or forward to pre-live our hypothetical future. Relive negative past too intensely and frequently can impair us in the present <laughs> as post-traumatic stress disorder. But PTSD is conceptualized only as a disorder in which people are haunted by their past. Given that reliving and pre-living are closely related abilities, I propose that pre-living our hypothetical negative future too intensely and frequently similarly impairs us as pre-traumatic stress disorder. I will investigate the ways in which people are haunted by their future. Awesome. So you had the uh, argument role. What did you feel was the central argument to this, this story? Um, well, in going through this, I came up with a few, but the one that I landed on that I thought kind of captured the point the best was that excessively pre-living a hypothetical negative future can lead to pre-TSD. Awesome. And Miva, do you feel like that captures what you were trying to argue in this, um, in this piece or... Yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's always hard when you're trying to sort of um, cut down what in your head is like, like this mess about what are the, the central elements. And so one of the things that I consistently struggle with um, thinking about this work is how much to bring in the relationship between pre-living and reliving and that whole kind of mental time travel thing. And so um, when I've tried to cut it down, I've really gone back and forth about whether to try and bring that in as well as just because um, what Andrea said pretty much sounds like just the future side, that if you um, think about the future in this like too intense, then that can cause you problems. But really, um, I mean, I guess that is what I'm arguing, but it, it seems like, to me, it feels like it's missing the, because that's what happens in the past bit of it. So the, the, the um, pre-traumatic stress is important, but the post-traumatic stress part is also important to your, to your work here and you, your right. words that might have been left out of this one. Uh, yep. other, other right. In the group, did you feel like um, reading that, the, the story that Miva provided us, did you think it was more about pre or post or both equally? I thought so it was best. more about the pre-living than and, and just using the, the the post 
in the past is just a comparison for the, the audience to, to understand what the pre-living could be like. So um, for me, I felt that the, the emphasis was on looking more pre-living um, in comparison to understanding that we know the past is something maybe similar, the post-traumatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It seems like post-traumatic stress is something that we're all somewhat more familiar with. So that's sort of a, an and. We all understand that concept, but maybe we haven't thought about pre-traumatic stress as much. Right. Um, Elizabeth, you were starting to say something. Yeah, for me, um, just looking at the text as it is, the but that's there is about PTSD. And, and, and that the problem is that all of the... Like the when it says like the PTSD is conceptualized only as a disorder or haunted by their past, that says to me like that's the problem. The problem is is right. not that we're not thinking about the future just yet, but just that that label only applies to stuff in the past, and that's how we think about it. So I, I think it makes sense to me um, that Miva's like no 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 we there's something about like there's a problem with that definition of PTSD, or there's a problem that all of the tools and the labels and the diagnostics that we have are for this thing, that's, and that that's the problem. But I mean, I mean maybe, maybe, maybe I'm yeah. off base. <laughs> no, no, that like where I'm, what I'm thinking about this project is that it would have implications for how we think about PTSD um, rather than just looking at the future for its own sake. All right, moving on to the sentence or the ABT portion of this, which was um, which was you, Elizabeth. So this was kind of challenging because Miva already provided us a pretty tight ABT structured uh, story here. But how did you simple this down, simplify this down to just a and but therefore sentence? Would you read that okay. for us? And so yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll read it and then we can I'll just read it first. So what I have um, intense stress and anxiety can result in post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, uh, which is when people frequently and intensely relive uh, traumatic events from their past. And there is a body of research on how to identify and treat PTSD. But mentally pre-living a hypothetical negative future may cause a similar kind of impairment with no label or treatment. Therefore, I will investigate the ways in which people are haunted by their future. Um, so uh, the reason I, I kind of put that together, just justification. Um, I, I went through this a lot and I could not figure out what the but was. Um, mm. Was it um, that, that PTSD is too narrow or is the but that um, pre-living the future can cause an impairment? Um, and because the therefore is to that you want to investigate um, all of the stuff about the future. Um, I felt that the but had to sort of go with the therefore. And if the therefore is there's just not a lot of investigation about the living future, the but has to be that PTSD itself is too narrow. So that's that's where I, I how I put that huh. together. Yeah. <laughs> well, that yeah, that's. Um... That makes sense because that's kind of something again with this project that I have gone back and forth on is like what exactly is the kind of first bit of this problem that I want to tackle and like and then the other pieces can fall into place you know behind that and I think it is um so can you read your butt again where you came down on right right but mentally pre-living a hypothetical future may cause a similar kind of impairment with no label or treatment yeah, so I think that that second part of the sentence um, makes makes sense to me. That it's, I mean, that's further down the road. Like I don't do the research that is um, developing, you know, treatments and diagnoses and and that sort of thing on the really clinical end of things. But um, yeah, I think it's a, a problem how we think about this uh, disorder in terms of only events, not possibly future events as well so um yeah that makes sense to me so um, you're uh did you, are, if i'm oh. hearing you right there the but sounds most like that there's essentially no label that this aspect of 
uh, trauma isn't thought about or acknowledged as much? Yeah, like we just don't know that much about whether if you travel into the future in a similar way, whether it causes similar problems for similar reasons. I have to admit, when I first read this paragraph, I actually thought this was science fiction. Like I thought, I, I thought people <laughs> literally being like mentally, you know, traveling into the future. And, and I, I wrote a whole ABT, like there's this new technology. Oh, wow. This in the past, <laughs> the future. And, and then I, I'm like, wait a minute. Love no. it. <laughs> this is why it's valuable to have scientists from different fields in these circles. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I felt like it, it needed a little bit more, um, like that common ground at the beginning, because I really yeah. thought, you mm -hmm. know, it was, which is why I started with the ABT, I started with the post-traumatic stress disorders, blah, 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 like just kind of, okay, we all know that this is like a real thing. <laughs> so, uh, Miva, if, if you, had, or sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think that, um, like, part of probably what you're battling with is that at the moment, moment before doing the research it's like therefore i'm going to investigate this thing but once you've done the research and you're structuring an abt at that point i think it will become a bit easier because the therefore can kind of more like more clearly capture the, the consequences like therefore this definition of ptsd is too narrow and you can build that out in the therefore um but at the moment because the therefore stops it therefore i'm going to look at the future it kind of sets the scene as if that's the most important piece. I think that's true. I've noticed in a lot of the science abstracts or work that my group was working on too before that it's hard to say we need to do more research is a really strong therefore. <laughs> but it's a lot of times what we want to do. Therefore, I'm going to do research. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a valid therefore, but it's hard to make that strong, especially because you don't know what the answer is going to be at the end of that. So I think you're right. Sometimes our pre-research ABT and then the one, if you were to, you know, have results and publish a paper, your therefore could be a lot, things could be made a lot tighter at that point. I'm actually really curious. Like, I, I mean, I don't personally have PTSD, but I gather that that you you are kind of reliving these memories and I'm curious like this idea did it come from like do people have really intense kind of pre-living of, of scary things in their future like their anxieties is that is that something that already exists that you want to investigate Neva? yeah so there's a separate literature on just people's ability to um, imagine the future and how much it overlaps with um, the ways and the things they think about in the past. But then um, really one of the, the first specific papers I read that got me onto this idea was looking at the sorts of things that soldiers anticipating deployment oh. and having symptoms of what looks like kind of a PTSD except about this upcoming period of deployment. But there are no support services for them. <laughs> right. Well, I yeah. mean, yeah, it's just not a thing. Yeah. That's really interesting. That, that is interesting. And I wonder if um, maybe the, the, the ABT um, paragraph could benefit a little bit from explaining that idea is that the same, the same incident it can be equally impactful before it happens and after it happens. Uh, because uh, like, honestly, reading this, uh, PTSD obviously thought about soldiers experience, but um, like, you know, drawing on my own experiences for pre-traumatic stress disorder, I was thinking more about like having to do public speaking or something like that, uh, which is maybe not as, um, traumatizing. So it, uh, I guess I, I hadn't realized that it was like looking a soldier sort of dreading going to war as much as being impacted after the fact. Um, can I jump in for a second here? I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this normally doesn't happen, but for demo's sake, I, I just want to jump in with a couple of quick comments here. Um, the ABT template, one of the things we've discerned in, over the past five years is that all else equal, the and part, the setup, uh, the best thing to have in there is two main things. 
first off world what the whole topic is you're working on but then secondly what's at stake um why is this likely to be important why do we care and it feels like that's missing a little bit from here why do we have good reason that this could even exist this pre-living and ptsd and that's the place you'd want to put something like that in there is any sort of evidence to suggest that this could happen number one and number two why is it important? And in the last couple of weeks, we've actually had a really interesting minor breakthrough, I think, which is realizing that in stating um, why is this important, one of the best ways to approach that is using the little clause of if then, which is, you know, we have reason to believe that this is really important. And if we could document this, then it might actually save X number of lives. But problem is nobody's really even studied this yet. Therefore, we're going to work on it. Um, but I just want to toss that in there, those two little comments, and I will now shut up. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. I think that kind of goes to what Allison was saying, which is, how do you make it therefore important if your therefore is therefore to do more research? And if you really set up, like, because if we could figure this out, lives could be then, like, of course you should do more research. That's a compelling therefore. If it's just like, mm -hmm. if we could figure this out, I could get published. To most people, that's not as compelling of a therefore. Sure. And then yeah. the therefore informs the but, too. Because if you have an, an if then, and where the therefore is, therefore we could help all these people, then the but is definitely, but right now those people are being underserved. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, that moves us on to the uh, word portion, which goes back to you, Andrea. So this paraphrases the biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky to say nothing in blank makes sense except in the light of blank. So Andrea, how did you fill in that template for this, uh, for this story? Um, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I've got two now. So I have the one that I came into this <laughs> with, which is what I took away from narrative, but then I've got now another one that I think better captures what you were trying to get at and maybe what a revised version of this narrative would um, communicate. So the one that I originally had was nothing in pre-traumatic stress disorder makes sense except in the life of excessive pre-living. So that's the focus more on the future side of the equation. Um, but now based on this discussion what I think that you actually want is something more along the lines of nothing in traumatic stress makes sense except in the light of intense mental time travel. Um, mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, which I think captures. Yeah, that second one is pretty, pretty much bang on what I have, like, as my sort of proposed answer for that. So, yeah. Andre, can you say but, again? Yeah, the, 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 sure thing. The both of them, or which one? The like, um, new one? Except in the light of. Uh, in free living was the, was the first one. And then what was the second one? Uh, so, so nothing in traumatic stress makes sense except in the light of intense mental time travel. Mm. Cool. Yeah. I think that's that kind of uh, eliminates the problem we we're having with the um, the argument at the end, but therefore as to whether it was the pre or the post traumatic stress. And in terms of traumatic stress, um, mm. nothing makes sense. It except in the light of either reliving or pre-living these, these events. Mm. Does that sound, am I butchering your work, Miva? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I like that summary of it. <laughs> if we did a, if we did an if then for this, if we had a, you know, if only we thought about um, PTSD or its symptoms as something that could happen uh, based on past or future events, then we could mm, uh, do right by you know, our soldiers or, or whatever, what other, other people we think we could help with, these, you know, with better treatment, better identification of problems and treatment and um then i feel like the 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 Dubzansi template could also include that kind of resolution you know nothing in treatment 
makes sense except in the light or, or treatment of traumatic stress um, makes sense except in the light of I like that intense mental time travel kind of in both ways. But as, as it's written, I, I love this mental time travel. Yeah, it was really, I struggled to try to find something that captured the intensity and the frequency and also pre-living and reliving mm -hmm. the like Otherwise, if it included all of those parts, it would no longer have really been the word template, it would have been like another sentence. But um, yeah, I think that's a good, the mental time travel thing, I think is a good way of summing it up in terms of future and past. Hmm. yeah and like well I, I mean obviously just um going back to your if then suggestion uh down the road it would have implications for treatment but at the moment uh i'm most interested i think in where do these symptoms come from in the first place because if it's only if it can only happen for past events then arguably it's something about that event actually happening Whereas if it can happen for events that have only happened in your head, then it really has to be all about how you were thinking of it, whether it actually happened in the world. And so it's like, why, where do these symptoms arise from? So it's not just about a memory, for example. It's right. about the feelings right. around that memory. Got to cut you off there. I'm sorry, we're moving on to the paragraph, the, the last part of this. So, um, watching we did this a little bit differently usually the first five meetings you bring the uh, story and you look at it, uh, using the story story cycle by maker uh, templates in the second half of the of the meetings the the sixth seventh eighth ninth and tenth you rewrite them into a fictional format using these story cycles that's a little bit more fun so we jumped right to that part so both allison and Miva wrote fictional versions of this story and um, Allison if you want to share yours first and then meet up and if you both want to talk a little bit about why you um, selected those elements for your for your fictional versions okay um, all right I'll start mine the pink eraser was almost unusable at this point Carrie had been chewing the ends of her pencils when she got nervous for as long as she could remember mrs. crabapple was circling the room Jenny looked pleased to grab the graded test from the teacher's hand. Dexter made a tear in the corner of his eye. As Carrie's test sheet fell upon her desk, the large red capital F seared into her eyes like a laser. It happened, she thought. It really happened this time. I actually failed a test. What will my parents say? What will they do to me? Carrie took a deep breath. It's all right, she said to herself. The school year isn't over yet. Mrs. Crabapple likes me enough. I will ask to do some extra credit. Before Carrie could even get up from her chair, Mrs. Crabapple suddenly boomed from the front of the classroom. Carrie Hudgens, you are the only student to have failed this test. This means you have failed eighth grade. There's no option of extra credit. I will see you in this classroom again next year. Shocked and embarrassed, Carrie's face rapidly warmed and she could feel tears welling up. Don't cry, don't cry, she pleaded with herself. A quiet whisper disturbed her panicking thoughts. Carrie, dear, Carrie. She looked up to see Mrs. Crabapple smiling down on her. I noticed you were daydreaming and you only have 20 minutes to complete the rest of this test. You're an excellent student and it looks like you're doing well so far. Please focus so you can complete the test in time. Yes, yes, of course, muttered Carrie. Thank you very much. Carrie spit the small pieces of pink rubber into her hand and wiped them on her jeans. Determined and focused, she returned to the half blank test in front of her. I will not get distracted. I will not panic. I have studied and can pass this test, she coached herself. When the bell rang, Carrie put down her pencil and a wave of relief washed over her. I passed, I know it, she thought. As she handed in her test on the way out of the classroom, Mrs. Crabapple warmly smiled. Good work and have a nice evening. Carrie sighed to herself, I will. There's nothing to worry about. That's the end of my fiction. <laughs> I love it. You went <laughs> far more the extra mile than I did. <laughs> I'm quite reluctant to read mine out now. <laughs> uh, before you read yours, Mima, since that one's fresh mm -hmm. in all of our heads, Allison, would you mind sure. just sort of walking through um, which template you used and um, which elements of this fit into that template? Uh, spend maybe about two minutes before we go over and uh, hear from Mima. 
Okay, um, I used the log line maker um, and there's nine steps in that. And you start um, with in an ordinary world. And um, that's where I started with Carrie chewing on her pencil, that that's something she always does. Um, the second element says a flawed individual. And the fact that she chews on pencils when she's nervous and she does it a lot, I thought was kind of speaking to her being flawed and not overly confident um, at school or where she was. Uh, this, section number three is her world is upended and that's where she actually does fail a test. Number four is after taking stock, um, she does take a deep breath and says it's okay, decides to take action. She's gonna ask for extra credit, thinking she can resolve this. Um, the number six on Logline Maker is, but when the stakes get raised, and that's when before she can even ask for extra credit, Mrs. Crabapple says only students failed, and you can't have extra credit. Um, then we have the last three steps is that they must learn the lesson in order to overcome the challenge and succeed. So she ends up kind of getting woken up from this daydream. Um, but at the same time, she really was not finishing her test. Um, so she did need to actually learn the lesson and stop daydreaming and take the rest of her test that she had studied for and then she could pass it and she had to stop worrying. So I, I tried to follow that. And, and one of the elements I thought from the um, Miva's original narrative was thinking that there had to be actual, it wasn't just in your head, it was, I know this is not like a soldier situation, this is somebody in a classroom, but that there had to be enough of a consequence of pre-living that it was, there were symptoms that it was impacting your life. So that's why I tried to build in the fact that she was actually not gonna be able to finish her test if she kept the behavior that she was doing. So I used the log line maker to help actually get her to the end where she does succeed. Awesome. And um, Miva, do you want to read your, your fictional version for us? Sure. <laughs> so mine is much less of a departure. Um, so one day a man goes to a psychology clinic with symptoms of PTSD. He sees a therapist who can't figure out what diagnosis to give him because he hasn't had a traumatic experience. The therapist makes careful note of his history and symptoms and decides to read up on various other disorders. The therapist realizes there's no disorder that sounds like what her client has. She realizes her symptoms must have arisen from a traumatic experience he's imagined might, and that she must therefore treat him for a pre-traumatic stress disorder and work them that way to resolve his symptoms. I'm guessing you also use the log line maker for that? I, I did indeed. <laughs> yeah. So, um... What what did you what did you think of Allison's story? Did that capture um, since you are intimately familiar with your work? Does that seem to capture and get at what what you've been thinking about and talking about with this pre traumatic stress idea? Yeah, so I really liked um, how it was like very vivid and intense, and she kind of almost didn't even realize that she was daydreaming because it was sort of unfolding before her eyes, and she was really sucked out of the present. Um, and your point about like that it would have to be for it to kind of matter, it would have to be something that's happening like, to enough of a degree that it's actually um, uh, having some sort of functional impairment for her in, in the present. Um, I really liked that that was in there as well. Um, and again, like this is, I guess I'd try and come up with something I didn't like about it, although I really did. <laughs> Um, it would maybe be the thing that I was talking about earlier where it's like it's not just about the past, it's uh, not just about the, the future, it's trying to sort of fold in this relationship with the past um, and how it's kind of similar and different maybe to um, the sort of traditional post-traumatic stress disorder. But then um, at the same time, like I was just saying, you know, this work isn't going to translate directly into um like therapeutic directives and so i really i'm so impressed that you came up with um this other scenario because i was sitting here this morning being like oh i, don't, I really don't want to make it about just a person in therapy so <laughs> i really like that you did. <laughs> well they always say you know write something you know and so i've, I've felt this way not exactly the same but <laughs> that's sort of where i got anxiety or pre-thought what happens if i 
failed or didn't do well in the SATs to get into college right, or, right. you know, something that you, I, I didn't pre-imagine, you know, pre-live it in a way that I felt was impairing me, but I've definitely done that in my life. So I tried to pull something that seemed a little bit more relatable to me. Sure. Yeah. And in fact, when we ask students, like, tell us something in the future that you have worried about in this kind of way, many of them are like, oh my God, my exams. So, <laughs> yeah. I just want to say, I really love that in both stories, um, you had one story, Allison's where where the hero is the person experiencing the the pre mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the pre traumatic stress and and in Miva's it's it's the it's the therapist trying to figure out what's going on. I thought that was really interesting that the different takes. The hero is the therapist versus the hero is the person experiencing the problem. Mm -hmm. That's a and great observation. One of the uh, pieces of advice that we always get when we start doing these fictional rewrites is to identify a single person or a small group of people to be the main character and that that does make it a much more compelling story. So I, I think it is interesting that you kind of chose two perspectives um, to highlight this, this issue from. And they're both interesting. You know, yeah, both, I, both they could be both the hero. Yeah, and maybe which one was the hero based on who you were. Like, oh, all right, everyone. I, I hate to cut you off, but that is the end of our, our stories circle for today. I'll send out a Google poll to get our next session. Oh, sorry, that's force of habit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so I will come barging back in here, and now we've got a half an hour for um, Q&A eventually. Um, Mike, if you can keep track of the time, after about eight minutes, go ahead and cue me and cut me off, and then we'll jump into the questions. But I'll say a few things, a few notes I've been making as we go along. First off, this was huge fun. You guys were all excellent, but of course, you've all done the full 10 sessions, so you're veterans and knew what you were doing. Um, just starting off with what we just finished there, the two stories, those were both great and what an amazing contrast. Um, one of them, Allison's was more kind of human and non-literal and drew me right in from the beginning with the chewing on the, the eraser. And then the F, um, it was really powerful moment there. Um, but that narrative didn't have quite as much information context of what it was about. And me buzz was more literal, had more of the substance of the, the issue, but um, at the other extreme, uh, didn't quite have the, the human. So it was kind of a good contrast, the two of them. Um, and let's see, so I wanna go back up, oh, excuse me one second. Um, <laughs> I had to shut the window there. Um, so I'm gonna quickly run through the four abstracts and my take on them, which again, great discussions from all, all of you. Um, you pretty much hit all the main points. The first one, and the science ones, was basically a whole set of therefore statements. And you think through and but therefore, therefore is the word of consequence, it's the actions that were actually taken. So what you got with that one was just a whole bunch of statements that we did this, we did this, we did this without the setup. It's not that either of these two abstracts had are wrong informationally. The facts are all right, which is why these are from published papers. It's just that narratively, they're more difficult for you to digest, um, especially if you're not in this field. So that's why you generally want the three elements to set it up, give us the one singular contradiction that the problem being studied, and then all of this stuff, this is everything that they found. But you'll find tons of papers it, every single day in all these journals that begin with this was measured this is what was found um, second one um, was actually pretty good ABT I, I gave it a seven and one of the interesting things about that one was that it had very tight a B a and B at the beginning set it up quickly with just a couple facts got right to that however the statement of contradiction and that's one of the things you want the quicker you can get through the a and the B the more we'll give you all day on the therefore and that really kind of conformed to that uh, a little bit. One little thing to add in on this that's kind of interesting is by the time you get to the end of this abstract, it's mostly about this thing, Vimentin. And yet, Vimentin is not mentioned until we get to the but, the, the however. Um, it's, it's like a major character that you want to introduce at the beginning. And this is where drawing on movie knowledge, uh, the people of Hollywood for a century have worked out this narrative stuff so much better than any other profession. That's the whole idea behind this. And think about this one as Imagine watching the movie Titanic, and we never even get to see Leonardo DiCaprio until after it hits the, the iceberg, and we've already come to the butt, the problem, and the ship is sinking, and suddenly this Leonardo DiCaprio character walks into the movie. It, that just wouldn't, it could happen. You know, we could still make sense of it. It just wouldn't be as logical and as powerful as setting these things up front. That's the challenge with this narrative stuff, is knowing exactly what you need for the setup at the beginning, 
and getting us quickly into the, the problem statement, then if it's well put together and tight like that, you've got our interest. The third one is actually the movie Eighth Grade, which I saw a couple years ago. And um, Eighth Grade got rave reviews, but it was kind of an artsy movie. And all it really was, was about a year in the life of this girl in eighth grade. Um, it was a fictional movie, but it felt almost like a docudrama. And it was very specific to that audience. And as a result, you could either grade this as an and, 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 or the other end of the spectrum of too much narrative. If you really, and in fact, Elizabeth, you seem to kind of be hitting on that, that you felt like there were a lot of little twists and turns, but that's almost more like DHY, uh, just multiple narratives that you saw. So, I mean, that's an interesting contrast between you and me. You saw DHY in it. I actually saw this movie with a um, female friend of mine. I didn't quite connect with it. I thought it got a little boring. It's, you know, artsy film, and, 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 and then halfway through, I turned to her, and she's crying. And I said, how can you be crying? And she just said, it's so real. And it wasn't real to me at all. I didn't live through these experiences in eighth grade. Eighth grade. And this is very important, because this is about the inner circle versus the outer circle. It's just like the people within your laboratory and everybody else. And when you are in that inner circle, you don't need this ABT stuff. You can communicate with those people through and, and, and very effectively and powerfully because it's actually a better way to capture the real world. But the question is, how big is that inner circle? And with this movie, you could see it didn't do very much at the box office. So it was powerful with the inner circle people, but not for the broad audience. And the last one uh, is the movie American Animals. It was on HBO just in the past month, which I thoroughly enjoyed. <laughs> and great movie. Um, in, in some ways, it's more of an ABT in my mind than it is here on, on paper. And, but it's a very simple story. You know, those guys living this dull, uninspired life uh, come up with this idea of how to make their lives interesting. But when they start to do this, they make a complete mess of everything. And therefore, and then... Um, I think, Elizabeth, also, you, you nailed it on this one, saying that there's no therefore at the end, Then you guys talked about that. That's what you find with the movies. They don't give you the therefore, and yet it's the same basic narrative structure. It's just that you don't want to give away the end of the movie, either in the trailer or in this um, overall summary. And I think that's sort of my um, basic notes. Also, well, I jumped in there on the ABT, um, but the last thing to say was the very beginning section um, on the ABT of, the, of Miva's narrative, um, in the very first section was the, the argument, and that's pretty interesting. You guys kind of got to that divide of, of what exactly is the argument. Uh, seems to me that what you, and, and this is also interesting because every scientist, everybody, when you're doing a project, a lot of people say, I don't like to argue, but you know, you've always got some argument going in your mind. And the argument here was that we put all this effort into studying PTSD from the past, but turns out there's this whole other form that nobody's really paid any attention to. And that's where if you could add something in about why you think that's important, that would add to the strength of the whole thing. Um, but I think that's your central argument that is go clearly going through your mind. It's written all the way through this thing, you know, which is we, everybody knows PTSD from the past. But what they don't really seem to understand is that there's this whole other form that's never been studied that could be potentially interesting, important. Um, Okie dokie. So on that note, um, Mike, do you want to see if anybody's got any questions or comments they want to jump in with? Okay. Uh, you have, the best way to do it is to raise your hand. And I, if, when I see your hand go up, I can uh, uh, recognize you if anybody has a question or a comment. This is to everybody in the group. Listen. All right. And interrupt me, but as we wait for that, I will blab on a few more things. Um, which is that, that you guys just did a great job on this thing. You're very fluid and fluent in the whole thing. And you kind of hit on a lot of those fundamental elements with the, the different um, abstracts. Any, any questions you guys have about the, um, how this one went? Okay, we've got one question here, just a second. Uh, okay. Hello. Okay, go ahead. Hi, my name is Robert McLaughlin. Hi. Uh, so with the, hi. Uh, hi, Randy. I've uh, enjoyed your books. Um, with the first two science abstracts, if we read the whole paper, would we see that the authors actually understand the narrative structure of their work and what they're trying to present, and the fault really lies in the way they've tried to boil it down to the abstract, or is the problem more deep-seated? 
Um, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the biggest challenge in all this stuff is time. And so everybody's trying to get papers written up and get them out and the editors have limited time. And this narrative stuff just basically takes time and you have to just think about it. And not only sitting at your desk, but also out doing physical exercise, constantly boiling it down, trying to get to the core of it all. And it's just like bad movies that you see from Hollywood. The vast majority of bad movies you see are so bad because they didn't put in the time to crack the nut of the narrative structure. And they ended up with a whole bunch of and, and, and stuff in it and in places where you lose the narrative, wander all over the place. So as I said before, it's not that most any research paper is wrong in terms of the information because almost always the facts are gonna be accurate there. But this is the communication dimension of it, which is that they're wrong and they did not find that optimum form, which is this three-part um, setup, problem, solution, or agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And so it's just a matter of ending up publishing things that are not finished products in terms of the narrative side of it. Uh, is, that, is that addressing what you're asking? Um, yes, but I also want to know, do you think the problem extends to their own thinking about the work? If you read the whole paper, as, or is the problem more cons confined to just the abstract? Oh, no, th this stuff applies for everything. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, all the way through it. And people ask that all the time. Is this ABT template just something to help you write a good abstract? Uh, no, absolutely, it's everything. And so, for example, when the research paper, um, your introduction is pure ABT. You're going to review the literature. That's all the end, and and then you're going to come to the the fundamental question. But nobody's ever really worked on this. Therefore, here's the methods and results we did. And then when you get back to the discussion, you're probably going to, if it's a good discussion, it'll follow an overarching ABT. But this is where it gets challenging. Is beginning to we we talk about nested ABTs. Um, the idea of you having an overarching ABT for an argument, and then it's built up out of sub ABTs. The example I use a lot in talks was uh, about two years ago, Oprah Winfrey gave a tremendous speech at the Golden Globes. The next day, the New York Times wrote a whole article analyzing it. I took it and broke it down by ABT structure. A friend of mine sent it to me the next morning. Did you match your ABT thing? And absolutely, you know, as soon as you looked at it, you could see it had an overall ABT. And what the New York Times called that was it said it was a story made up of stories. So it's that nested structure. And so all the way through, ideally, you want to <coughs> um, landing on that ABT structure. Uh, Thank Mike, another question? Yeah, from uh, Julie Clausen. Uh, when forming a story circle, do the five people know each other or do they start working together as strangers? Great question. In the beginning, we've learned so much in the last five years doing this, and we had a bunch of misconceptions at the beginning, one of which was, wouldn't this be great if all five people in the lab did the circle together, they build this bond and language and everything like that, which is true, but the more we've done it, the more we've seen the value of diversity in the group, um, including right now, my good friend, Joe Newman, who works in child development psychology, and really on the practical side, working with kids, and he did the demo day last year, and right now he is in a group with four research scientists from National Park Service, so he's a total outlier there. And over and over again, he's brought this different voice in. Um, you really want that outlier voice. You want somebody who doesn't know your world that holds the bar up for you, because you ought to be able to make your stuff understandable to somebody. That's, that's the power of the ABT. And uh, furthermore, we've had circles that I've listened into that have, have been five people all working in the same system, five scientists, and really smart people doing a good job absorbing this stuff, but I listen in a circle and begin to realize, wait a second, they're slipping into a fair amount of and, and, and stuff because they'll work on somebody's narrative, and because they know everything to do with it, just like that eighth grade movie, to them, they, it sounds really good, oh, this is so interesting, but what you need is the total outsider to come in and say, I'm sorry, but you've lost me, and you should be able to make the simple logic of what you're standable to everybody, ideally. So that's where we more and more, in fact, I think the future of what we're headed towards, I wanna to start building a mechanism where we actually uh, take somebody like a screenwriter and throw them into an added extra element in a circle with scientists. That's the best thing that could have is someone that, that sets the bar way up there and just keeps saying, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand it yet. Um, yeah, another question? Uh, okay, before anybody has any further questions, uh, instead of trying to find a, the raise hand, just use the chat box and send the question to everyone and I'll see it and read it out. So Randy, the next question is from Mona. I am not familiar with Logline Maker and StoryCycle and would appreciate a short explanation of them. 
Okay, great. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to get into read my book, um, but they're in the book. Houston, we have a narrative and, and laid out in, in clear detail. Um, these are both templates that are at the higher level of storytelling, which is why we save it for the last 10 minutes of the hour. They, in the beginning, when you're doing the 10 one hour sessions of story circles, the one word and the, and the sentence are much more analytical, easier and more comfortable, and everybody loves those in the beginning. But with time, you, and the, the paragraph seems frustrating, like, oh, it's so vague and nebulous, and it seems like wacky Hollywood stuff. But as you begin to master those two shorter one word, one uh, sentence elements, people get more and more intrigued by the paragraph and begin to learn bits and pieces. So the log line maker is um, a simple structure that almost underpins like a movie trailer. You can almost feel the movie trailer dynamics in it. And let's see if I can remember the nine elements. Um, it is number one, in an ordinary world. So as you heard um, Allison breaking it down, you know, in an ordinary world, so we've got this character, um, we described the character, um, who has a flaw. So her flaw, and actually I wasn't super clear on it, chewing on the, the eraser was kind of neurotic. It would have been nice to have dug a little deeper on defining what the flaw was there. Uh, but this character suffers from this flaw. And in the third element, um, the character gets their world upended when is delivered the F on the exam, you know, the greatest fear ever, and boom, everything's thrown into chaos. And the fourth element is the character now must make a decision, must take stock of things and decide, um, am I going to do something about this or am I just going to fold up and run away from it? And this is where you pull the audience in, is that moment where, okay, I'm going to do something about this. I am going to get to work and do better and ask for extra credit. Um, the fifth uh, element then is the actual action of jumping in. Okay, I'm going to do this. This is the action I'm going to take. The sixth element, I think, is the stakes get raised where, you know, I'm going to get to work and do more stuff, but then all of a sudden something more adverse happens and the problem gets even bigger. And finally, in the seventh element, the character flashes back to what we set up there in the second element, which was... And the character begins to realize, wait a second, in order to make this work, I really got to dig down inside myself and realize that the, the source of my problems isn't this external stuff. It's really something inside of me. In the eighth element, finally figures that out. And the ninth uh, element is victorious. So it's a, it's a template. It's a much more complicated template than just the end, but therefore. But it has the end, but therefore at the core of it. And it's all these things that you know, go on and on are in, endlessly fascinating. Um, did you guys have anything in the group to say further about that? Here's one thing I want to ask you guys to talk about, which is what I just said there about in the beginning when you did the 10 sessions, didn't you find that the, the one word and the one sentence was easy to pick on the ABT and the Dobjansky came easily and the paragraph was frustrating in the beginning, but as time went on, you began to get more in. And so Elizabeth, I see you nodding. Uh, can you jump in and say a few things about that? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I actually am in the middle of my second story circle right now. And um, so the first time I definitely felt that the paragraph was really challenging. It's like, what? We made an ABT. What more do you need? Like, what more do you want from us? And, and you have this, like, this log line, which is straightforward, but the story cycle one, I never really understood. And, and now that I'm actually in my second story circle, I actually feel like, like I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I want to kind of practice that log line or practice that story cycle, practice raising the stakes, in other words, kind of getting to that next level, because I think it does make for a better narrative. Other folks? The other thing I would add to that is that these templates are both drawn explicitly from the world of fiction. So like if you take the Star Wars films or some, some classic story like that, you can easily break it down into these, these elements of the template. So the challenge is taking something non-fictional and scientific and fitting it into this, um, you know, fictional template that is obviously a very compelling story when there's lasers and stuff involved, but how do you, how do you take that back and make it, uh, you know, more laboratory lasers than shooting ones? Um, Okay, let, let me add on to that, because um, there was a, a question I think you skipped over, Mike, uh, from Jennifer. How hard is it to convince physicians who write papers of the value of the ABT method? Um, let me say a bigger picture thing on this, my own personal journey, which is 25 years ago, I moved to Los Angeles, went into film school at USC from a completely different world. I was a tenured professor of marine biology and then 
entered into this cinema program. And I was very little literal minded as a scientist. And from day one, they told us this writing stuff's important and this formulaic stuff that we're talking about. And you can, that's a dismissive way to, to label it is this is all formulaic, ABT, yada, yada, yada. And they told us from the beginning, it's really important. The Greeks figured this out long ago. And over the years, people have, you know, more and more kind of formalized it. And my science mind rejected it from the beginning, literally. And you can see it in the student film that I made in my second year there. It had very weak story structure to it. It was crazy and fun and wild, won a bunch of awards, but people said it didn't tell a very good story. Uh, it's been in my first book, Don't Be Such a Scientist, I told about that, about rebelling against this. The science mind gets programmed against this, this sort of narrative stuff, um, and it becomes a little bit of a battle. But in a world of too much information, things are shifting and it's becoming increasingly important. And as a result, um, starting to make some headway with physicians. So that was your question. I was given this award in January from the American Medical Writers Association. And when I asked them, why in the world would you give me this award? Because I've never done anything in biomedical communication. They said, because we're using this ABT framework more and more. So it's starting to get some traction and it'll continue because it, it's very powerful. It just takes a lot of time and it's an endless journey. This is not something even at the end of the 10 sessions, uh, which is why that's amazing, Elizabeth, you're doing um, a whole second round on it. But it's just, you, if you start to think of it in terms of that, that physical fitness um, analogy, it, that part of your mind, and you just push on it. And the last thing I'll say about that was, as soon as this virus stuff started a month ago, I took a vacation for three weeks, all my travel got canceled, and literally I just sat around like, wow, I don't have to travel, this is great. And I got my mind off everything and kind of let the narrative part of my brain turn flabby. And just last week, ended up having a couple long discussions um, with a graduate student working on a PhD at Colorado State University in Biomedical Sciences, um, Marissa, um, who I mentioned earlier about that if-then thing, and Marissa Metz. And in our discussions, I hadn't talked about this stuff for almost a month, and we dove into her narrative, her dissertation, and that's where all of a sudden I came across this, wait a second, you know, we're constantly asked this question of what's at stake, why is this important? There's a deeper dimension that, a way to address that, which is, if we do this research, here's what we can learn. That's how you can convey one way of how important something is. And this if then, then divide, and it was great, Elizabeth, you picked up on that and, and tried to apply it into there because this is just, it's just hit us in the last couple of weeks, but I sent it to a whole group of folks and everybody dug through it and said, yes, that, that's really a simple analytical way to address this endless question of why should we care about the research you're talking about? And you should care because if we can do this work, then we can do this, or there's even a negative direction go. If we don't do this work, then we're going to get these consequences. So that's another deep dimension that we've just kind of stumbled across. Um, another question? We've got 10 more minutes. Uh, Mike? Uh, I have one from Selena. And let me see if I can unmute her and she can ask you. Uh, Great. Hold on a second. Okay, go ahead. Hi. 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 Here's if there's like a preferred <laughs> educational experience with writing um, to join the story circle. Um, so I have been writing for some time, but I don't have any formal training <laughs> in writing, such as um, like in journalism or kind of in like a professional training in writing. So I just didn't know if there was a preference for that. Um, one, first off, one of the greatest things about story circles is that it's relevant and applicable for absolutely everybody. And it's, this ABT template is really the fundamental criteria that makes the difference between whether you're going to end up being boring and confusing versus interesting. And so the narrative spectrum is basically this, this gradient of how much narrative content you've got. And if you have too little narrative content, as we saw with that one, synopsis, if it's all and, 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 there's no contradiction, then you're going to bore people by just going on and on. That first abstract, the one with all the therefores, I mean, you could also kind of read that as, as and, 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 but, it, but it's, it's therefores because it's all the things they're doing, but it really was kind of boring. As everybody said, there's no, what's the problem they're addressing? I mean, everybody go out and measure a whole bunch of things. It's a waste of effort if we don't know why you've done all that sort of work. Um, and so the, the template ends up giving you, and then at the other end of the spectrum is DHY, where you've got too much narrative. And this is what you get with a lot of academics. Despite this, however this, yet this, but this. And they're going off in multiple narrative directions, which are interesting in their inner tiny circle, but everyone else gets lost. 
So this is about helping you develop the intuition to get you to that bullseye in the middle where you can feel it. Here's how much setup we need. Here's the one problem that we're, that's all built around. And now here's what we're doing. And let me give you a quick little aside on that. There's a lot of movies nowadays. You can see how they're addressing it exactly like this. If you saw the movie 1917 that everybody raved about, which was visually stunning, but that movie goes through the first two minutes of the entire movie. It's stunning. All it is is the, office, the guy walks up to the one soldier and says, bring a friend, come to the general's tent. There's your hand in, and they go to the general's tent. And the general says, we've got these troops that are out on the front, but we've lost communication with them and they're gonna die. That's why it's important what's at stake unless we get somebody out there. Therefore, we want the two of you to run through the trenches and the rest of the entire movie after that two minute AB setup is all there for. Therefore, they run here, they do this, blah, 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 blah. Movies are converging more and more on squashing that AB into the smallest little thing at the beginning just to get us in there so then we can take off running um, on the whole story. And let's see, we got another one, Mike? Yeah, I, I got one uh, that Leanne uh, asked but, uh, and got, got an answer from someone else, but I think you can expand on it a bit. She just wanted to know, what is DHY? And she okay, now good. knows that it's despite however yet, but what does that mean? Okay, uh, and before I jump into that one, actually let me finish the last one because I realized I didn't really answer your question very well. Um, but I think what I was trying to say is that narrative is kind of detached from all these other things. And so this is a really good training to do um, separate from learning how to give a good talk because we don't do anything in there about how to give a good talk, how to make eye contact with the audience or any stylistic stuff in writing papers, things like that. But what narrative gives you is the core of how to put things together to hold people's interests. So that's the bottom line is you don't need any of those sorts of experiences. But the last thing to add to that we have learned is that the more you have life experiences, the more valuable this training is. So a lot of, we thought in the beginning this might be great for undergraduates. Turns out undergraduates haven't done enough projects to really be thinking through, why did this thing go wrong? What could I have done better? When we get to graduate students, postdocs, and research scientists, they've got this context of a whole bunch of things they've done, some of which haven't done so well, and they can see how it applies. So that's one of the things we're learning is a little bit of a, a gradient with that. Um, to go back to the DHY, so again, if you look in the, the book, and of course we didn't have time to go through everything in my setup at the beginning, so I, I said that some people would be a little bit lost, but in the Houston book, we lay out the central tool, which is the narrative spectrum, and it's that simple gradient of how much narrative content have you got in something. If you got no contradiction, you end up with just the and, 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 that's non-narrative and that bores people. If you have too much contradiction, uh, and that's what DHY is. So all those words are words of contradiction. So they're all the same as but, you know, but this, despite this, however this, every time we hit on one of those words, your brain fires up a new narrative direction. And but is the most common word of contradiction, which is why it is in the, um, the, the and but therefore template. But there are these other ones. In fact, you saw in that first um, abstract, however, um, or the second one there, the word of contradiction was however, and there's your DHY, despite, however, yet. We chose those three just to represent this idea of too much narrative, of, uh, despite, however, and yet. So next question. Um, I don't have one immediately, uh, but. Okay, well, maybe we're getting to being able to wrap this up and um, let's see any other thoughts from you guys on how valuable um, oh let's see I'm, I'm seeing there what is it how can we find a training session Others. yeah okay. um, so the in that mass email that you got today with the link to get on here we have the links on there for the website storycircles.training.com you can go there and look at the videos there and get a feel for it and then the email address if you want some specific details. But the way this generally runs, it's not an individual thing that you can just sign up for. Although, you know, that may open up now if we're, we're modifying things towards this um, online world given the circumstance. So previously, it's been large institutions book the whole demo day. We go there, 40 people. It's all about them. Uh, but now, we're getting to the point where we're coming up with a model to do smaller demo days with probably like 10 or 12 people. Uh, the book costs a lot less and we do it online. So anyhow, email us if you want the specifics on how those will work. And uh, any other questions, Mike? Okay. Otherwise, yes. Yeah, I've got one. Really, actually, it's a really good one. Is there a limit to the number of stories within a story? 
No, no, you know. But the number story. of maybe the number of narratives within a within a within a, within something. Well, okay, now that there's a lot of facets to that, but um, no, you, you're maybe partly getting on the desire for the singular narrative, and this starts to get into deeper the divide between mass communication versus more artsy, smaller crowd communication. So think of it in terms of movies, they're always the good analogy. Um, there is a structure to the big mass movies, Star Wars and everything else like that, that do connect with the big broad public. And that is, they tend to have a singular narrative at the center. You will notice all those franchises are successful. Luke Skywalker was the single one character. There are lots of characters in the movie, but in the end, one of the things they always told us in screenwriting or asked us is whose story is this? And that becomes the challenge, you know? And artsy movies, you can see a movie where there are five different characters. It's all an ensemble thing and they're all equally fun, interesting, but those movies don't reach much of a mass audience. So this becomes your, your fundamental question. Are you really wanting to reach a bigger, broader audience than the people that are already interested in your stuff? And if not, then you really don't need a lot of this. If you only want to communicate with the people in your lab, then you don't need this ABT stuff. That's, that was the whole point with that eighth grade movie. If the people are already there in your world, they actually will prefer that you don't do this sort of reworking of the material. But that's only a tiny little group that you need to be aware of because in general, if you're writing an article for a journal from the very beginning, you know, it's assumed that you're trying to make your science understandable to people that aren't in, in your exact field. That's why you see the ABT structure all through the template, the, the MRAD template, introduction methods, results, and discussion. Um, and let's see, somebody mentioned there, War and Peace has a lot of stories, exactly. So I don't think that there's any limit to the number of stories within a story. That is exactly the challenge. And, you know, think of something like Breaking Bad, one of the very best TV series ever made. You can spot the ABT for the entire series. And then within each season, there are ABTs. And each character's got ABTs. It goes all the way on down to individual scenes having ABTs. It's this very simple little three-part structure that's repeated over and over again, and this is how the brain is programmed. Set up or agreement, contradiction, and consequence um, at the core of it. And we only got a couple minutes left here, but uh, any one last comment on how you guys have been applying this and what you do, maybe starting with uh, Michael and each of you? Uh, for myself, I think the, the thing that I just go to every time I start a new writing project now is that Dobzhansky template and try and boil it down to nothing in what I'm working on right now makes sense except in the light of, and then if I can distill that to one single topic. And then throughout my writing, I always just kind of reflect on that. Am I still talking about this core idea? You know, is this still the main focus? So it's just... Um, Beyond honing my narrative muscles, it's just kind of given me a great way to start every project that ensures that I'm, I am I feel like I'm staying on the right track and that it maintains narrative strength throughout. Okay, great. Um, if, unless anybody else has one last urgent comment you want to make, we're at the end of the hour and a half here, and I, I kind of want to wrap it up on time. Uh, but for anybody listening, if you've got questions, please email us, and we're glad to continue the whole conversation. Um, the five of you did a wonderful job. It's so fun. And I haven't listened in on a session like this for a few years, but it's just, it's really entertaining and enjoying. Um, so thank you all very, very much. And with that, Mike, shall we wrap it up?